global surgery is not is is less about how to push the envelope as far as technique and do things better surgically. It's really more about how to make sure that everybody who needs surgical care can get surgical care. So it's really about service delivery, the public health aspects of it. So I'm really happy to be talking about this because as a spine surgeon, um, it's been something that I think the spine surgery community has been looking at, but I think it's ready. Uh, times it's, it's just the right time to talk about this. So let's see here. All right, so you know, as, as, uh, I, I, I taught neurosurgery in Ethiopia. I was director of spine surgery. Um, and then and after that, I lived in Cambodia for three years and teaching neurosurgery and spine surgery at a government hospital. And, and there's a couple of observations. Well, first of all, this picture is from the COSEXA uh, examination. This is the de facto board certification for neurosurgeons in, in 16 countries in Africa. And um, I was one of the examiners, and I'm really proud to, to say that three people, three other examiners on this picture are some of my, my former residents. But what I want to point out here is that training is essential for sure, but it's insufficient for system level changes. You know, when I was in Cambodia, I, I realized that we can train a thousand neurosurgeons, uh, spine surgeons, but they don't have a place to work. You know, they don't have an OR, they don't have equipment, they don't have nurses, ICUs. And, and what I really wanted to do is work on system level changes. So what, what that led me to do is to come back to Boston uh, uh, and then and, 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 and got a master's in public health. And the, and the trigger for that was this uh, Lancet Commission report in 2015. And the, the reference is here at the bottom. And these three co-chairs, John Muir is my boss, Andy uh, Leather and Lars Hagender, they wrote this sort of a seminal piece on, on the current situation of surgical care in developing countries. And these are the, some of the key messages. More than half the population in the world, they lack access to essential surgical care, timely, affordable, and safe surgical care. Up to a third of global burden of disease is actually surgical. 81 million people go bankrupt. They become catastrophically uh, 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 impoverished as a result of cost of surgical care. And the poorest third countries uh, of the other countries only receive 6% of surgical care. And almost 17 million people die as a result of inability to access surgical care. I'd only mention that the HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria, the mortality from those three this represents three times those uh, the deaths from those three diseases combined. So um, at Harvard, there's a program in global surgery and social change. John Mira, I, I mentioned the director. I joined this team after I got my master's in public health. And there are two neurosurgeons on faculty, me and uh, Ben Worf, who's a pediatric neurosurgeon. And we have a, an, an army of, of fellows and RAs, research associates. And some of them happen to be neurosurgeons. So we have Ernest from uh, Mount Sinai, uh, Jacob Lepard from University of Alabama, uh, Jackie uh, Corley from Duke. And so we take one or two residents a year just to work on global neurosurgery issues. So we had some of the fellows previously were uh, Michael Duan and 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 uh, 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 Vaughn, <laughs> Vaughn, Kerry Vaughn, excuse me. Our current two fellows, are, uh, we have two guys. We have Adam Amar from uh, Albert Einstein. And some of you may or may not recognize Myron Rowe. Uh, he was an uh, NFL uh, football player and now is a resident in neurosurgery at Mass General. And he's also a Rhodes Scholar. But he's, he's coming on as uh, our fellow for the next two years. So we have a team. And we don't, what we don't do is go and do mission work. Uh, and, this, and this intention, I'll tell you why. What we work is actually with ministries of health and, and the World Health Organization in helping countries develop multi-year strategic plans to strengthen all of their surgical care, right? So this is an example of a workshop we did in Dubai. We have ministries of health and the Harvard Program in Global Surgery is actually an official uh, collaborating center for WHO in health system strengthening and surgical system strengthening. So here's what, what's been going on. As I mentioned, we have WHO, they have a global action plan for surgical care, ministries of health. We also engage with financing uh, uh, partners. World Bank is a big one. And then we create these national surgical plans and help implement them. So we've started with uh, work in Africa, Anglophone Africa. We you know, focused on Asia after that, Western Pacific. So we've uh, been made some progress in this. So we have right now over 44 countries uh, at, at some level of development, uh, of engagement in national level projects to strengthen surgical services in their whole country. 
So this is why we call it a, a, a global surgery movement. We have passed over the tipping point, and, and, and there's now um, a massive movement in all these countries. And it's going to change the, the face of surgical care in these countries. So now, uh, as you know, I'm a, I'm a neurosurgeon, and within global surgery, I wanted to make sure that neurosurgical services were fully integrated. And so we, there was a process by which we engaged a certain number of neurosurgeons to really work on this issue of what is the burden of unmet neurosurgical uh, needs, what are the workforce requirements. And I'm not going to get into all the details, but we had a, um, a very public-facing declaration in December of 2016, basically uh, saying to the neurosurgical community, the unmet neurosurgical needs of everyone in the world is our responsibility to, to, to address. And then we've had some uptake. The World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, they bought into this. And now, now we have a map on their website that, that shows exactly how many neurosurgeons are in each country. Our society in the US, American Association of Neurological Surgeons, they've embraced the idea of a global neurosurgery. And uh, so there's been a lot of uh, excitement and things are moving forward. So uh, on the research front, if you look at the uh, PubMed and then punch in uh, global neurosurgery as a, as, as a term, there's very little uh, in, the, in the literature. But starting 2016, there's been an explosion of number of articles that address the delivery of neurosurgical care in, in the developing countries. And it's, uh, I think we, we can't get any higher than this. Jim uh, Kim was the president, uh, the president of the World Bank, this past president, and he was chosen to give the Cushing oration for the AANS meeting last year. Unfortunately, there's no meeting this year. And he highlighted global neurosurgery in his, uh, in his uh, Cushing oration. So he's, it's the slide that we just, I just showed you about the research output. So global neurosurgery is a thing right now. So what is global neurosurgery? And as I mentioned earlier, it's not so much about the clinical practice and, and pushing that forward, but it is that plus more. And we're adding another dimension to practice of neurosurgery, which is the public health aspect of it. And it's really about making sure that everyone uh, has access to timely, safe, and affordable neurosurgical care. And there's an equity dimension, right? Why should some of us have it when others not have it? And we feel that's not fair. And we believe everybody in the world should have access to neurosurgical care when they need it. So this is a, a this, this global neurosurgery has become institutionalized within the World Federation, and we have actually formed a neuro, global neurosurgery committee at the WFNS, and, and I'm actually one of the co-chairs. So what do we know so far about the unmet needs? Well, we, this is the research that we did at Harvard, uh, 5 million unmet neurosurgical operations each year. Most of it, as you can see, is in Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia. And to meet that demand, unmet demand, we need 23,000 additional neurosurgeons today. So that's a massive uh, uh, undertaking. Now, ministries of health need information. They need guidance on some of these things because can you, there are no neurosurgeons sitting in ministries of health, right? So what we need to do is, uh, and what we found there was a need, we need to advise ministries of health on policy issues, not so much clinical care, but how to manage for the whole population, neurosurgical services. So one of the first things we tackled was uh, what are the recommendations for policy level for head and spine injury in developing countries? And this was published. And one example of this particular uh, policy uh, document is the surgical system. What are the requirements? So things like how, uh, how many neurosurgical services uh, centers are needed in a given country, right? And that's evidence-based. And we came up with four hours, no more than four hours from uh, 80% of the population. What are the workforce requirements to deal specifically with the head and spine injury requirements in, in a given country? And we, our uh, research showed that we need at least one neurosurgeon per 200,000 people. So just start thinking about, from spine surgery point of view, some of these questions, not so much the technical aspect, but the delivery aspect of uh, spine surgery. So uh, I wanna just highlight two research that we did. One has to do with estimating the traumatic spine injury uh, uh, burden around the world. And uh, uh, you know, we actually excluded vertebral, uh, the uh, osteoporosis fractures because those are a little bit different and uh, we'll get to a little bit later. But here's what we know, right? So there's a higher incidence of traumatic spine injury as you get to the Latin America, South, uh, Southern Africa, uh, South Africa, and then Southeast Asia and then lower incidence in the higher income countries. That shouldn't be surprising. There are more road traffic accidents, more injuries and things like that. But if you look at the number of 
cases of spine, traumatic spine injuries is about 100,000 in the high-income countries, but almost eight times as much in the developing countries. And I would argue most of this is not being addressed surgically at this point. So we're estimating about half of these numbers in surgical care, and a bulk of it, 400,000 cases, are not being done at the moment. And if you look at the absolute numbers here, the numbers, you know, the African numbers, uh, Southeast Asia and Western Pacific. The other question we looked at is how about degenerative spine conditions? And this is a little bit, a little, little, little uh, sensitive because we couldn't, we, we actually excluded this from the 5 million operations that we need uh, that, that's, uh, that's unmet. And there's, a, there's we wanted to be very conservative. And there was some argument that a lot of this was what we call non-essential surgical care. And we can get into the discussion whether or not you need surgery for back pain or not, right? Some of those, there are different practice patterns. But here's what we found. There's 266 million symptomatic degenerative spine diseases in the world. And the reason the incidences are lower in the developing countries versus high-income countries is because they're underdiagnosed. People in, in Africa aren't going to doctors and getting discograms done because they just bear with it. So they're, they're underdiagnosed. Even while they're being underdiagnosed, lower and middle income countries currently have four times as many number of cases than high income countries. And most of these are not being dealt with surgically. And some of them actually do need surgery. So uh, let's uh, turn the question back to uh, spine care. Uh, we talked about osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures. There are 700,000 per year in the U.S. This is my, you know, what, what I came up with on the research. Whether or not, you know, that's just in the U.S. Some of them will need surgery. And so, you know, what are the, what's the global uh, burden of this? And what is the disparity between high-income and low-income countries? And, and then we have this question of scoliosis, the adolescent idi idiopathic scoliosis. We also know what this incidence is. There's a massive screening program in developing countries. Why should some of those kids get surgeries and some of these kids not get surgeries, right? And so this is it's the equity issue. Are there other conditions we need to be talking about? So um, there's a list of some of the people that I personally know, but there are, I'm sure, tons of others who are working on uh, trying to help developing countries. You know, Roger Hardo, uh, Michael Hagelin, Bart Green, Ken Chung, uh, uh, Young Jung Kim. They're all doing some fantastic work in developing countries and then trying to go there and, and, and unload some of these backlogs or some of these technically challenging cases. But what if right now spine surgical medical mission uh, model or, or a capacity building gets integrated into the global surgery movement? And I, I totally encourage you to think about it in that terms because this is moving on. Governments are actually developing five, 10 year plans to scale up surgical care and spine surgery absolutely should be at the table, at least to give an uh, input. But there are some challenges, okay? I'm gonna mention three, there may be others. One is spine surgery is uh, dealt with by multiple specialties, and we all know this. There, I'm a neurosurgeon, we have orthopedic surgeons in the room, chiropractors. How do you manage the, the, the specialty uh, issues within global spine surgery? That's one. And this, I, I mentioned this earlier about spine, uh, degenerative spine conditions. What's essential and what's not essential? And that needs to be worked out. And it's, it's, it's not clear. And the last one I will say is, is the private sector industry in, uh, interests. Technology is important, but how do you use that? Does it help with equity? Does it improve training in developing countries? Or does it shut them out? And these are some important questions to, 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 to answer. So uh, that's the end of my uh, 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 talk. I just want to say that I am a spine surgeon. I've been devoting most of my time on global surgery. I would love to engage with other collaborators on how to move global spine surgery forward. And there's my email. Thank you very much. Key, another outstanding uh, lecture. And uh, thank you so much for bringing a dose of reality for our first world problems of robotics or not uh, to us. Um, hats off also to taking an approach that basically uh, emphasizes collaboration rather than having this kind of missionary approach of, oh, we have something so much better. Uh, this is how you do it. And uh, developing kind of a medical tourism approach, a condescending kind of a, a great visitor who comes and uh, preaches something and then expects locals to deal with the consequences and complications. So big deal. Um, what do you tell your residents and fellows when they say, oh, I want to go to an exotic sounding country and uh, do this and that for a week or two or three to add that to their uh, CV? 
uh, when we have such amazing unmet needs. Like here in Washington State, I can tell you there are several communities not that far away from here uh, where we really have crazy unmet uh, problems and we see exotic and difficult things. And there's not a great coverage at all, for instance, in the eastern part of our state. Uh, what do you tell those young residents and fellows as to where should we put our emphasis in our own internal unmet needs or should we go somewhere exotic? Uh, that's a great question. So, you know, we have an orientation process for all of our fellows and, and, and our research associates about cultural sensitivities, looking at what we call colonial uh, thinking right, sort of the global north and global south uh, uh, type of dynamics. I mean, I mean, I'd be very blunt, you know, this whole idea of white is right, you know, that they, you can have someone who's really not very smart, and but he says something very authoritatively, and he comes from global north, and they say, okay, maybe this is right. And this, this is a very difficult thing to change overnight, but we do emphasize with our fellows this whole, you know, try to understand it, uh, 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 and then be aware of it, and so that, you know, they're not part of the problem and they're, they're part of the solution. Um, there are disparities within the U.S., right? I'd be the first one to admit that, but we're not focusing on that at this point because U.S. health system is, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a Pandora's box once you start getting into it. It's, for us, we choose to focus on the developing countries.